Well, it's my great joy to welcome uh, the very Reverend Canon Mark Richardson, uh, Dean of uh, CDSB, our local seminary, and longtime friend of St. John's to uh, our worship lounge today. Uh, thank you for being a part of this, Mark. Thank you, Scott. I, I'm always reminded when somebody introduces me that way that when I say that when my children hear the very Reverend, they say, you didn't ask me. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I secretly have started a trend at St. John's to refer to me as the somewhat Reverend. <laughs> it's a little, it's a always a little more accurate. <laughs> well, uh, Tell us a little bit, just before we get started with some of the, the bigger questions here, how, how the seminary has been, I know you're doing some great things there to, to, uh, to be supportive of the response to this terrible virus. Well, just I'll get to the emergency things and then on to some, some things we wanted to do in relationship to our neighbors. Um, we started two, three weeks ago now, an emergency response team within the school in order to address some immediate things for the school in behalf of the community. One of the first things we had to do was close down our dormitory because it's called congregate living. Uh, it has common restrooms, for example, and common eating facilities. And uh, so that's an emergency for the students. And we put a, a deadline on that and found space for everybody that was safe space, some people going home, uh, but things like that in order to make the campus itself a safe space was our immediate concern and to keep the students in a lively enough position where they could uh, continue to do coursework. Uh, you probably already know, most people know that we have in a way taken a lead with among seminaries uh, in our Episcopal Church with online educating. So our, our faculty was able to make that transition pretty well once we got around to setting up the rest of the semester uh, and how we would complete the year. Uh, so we're going to make that transition well. Once we got settled down, but you know, one of the other things before I move on, uh, we, our chapel is active for morning prayer, Eucharist and evening prayer. And one of the chief concerns of the students was probably the chief concern of your congregation. How do we gather in new ways? And uh, I've been really impressed with how students have found voluntary prayer groups through alternative medium. And um, we are setting up a, a time of meditation with each other online as well. Uh, it was clear that the chapel means a lot in the formation process here. Um, to be a neighbor, one of the things that became very clear was that the university was could very well be in a crisis uh, when it comes to uh, need for infirmary space for isolation because they have very little uh, space that's good for that on their campus. I reached out to the vice chancellor about that uh, to, to offer them Easton Hall, which is capable of being an isolation unit. Um, they were very grateful for that and that's what it's become. This is an infirmary an isolated space, their medical team from public health and their housing people came over and uh, did all the specs, all the things they needed to do to make it that kind of a safe space. So uh, we're, you know, we're cooperating with the university to make sure we take care of people around here. That's absolutely so wonderful. And, uh, uh, and by extension, it feels very much like you're doing that on behalf of all of us who are who see the seminary as such a uh, uh, a place of centric uh, happenings and discussions and learning. Uh, so uh, we so appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I uh, am disturbed by uh, that I see, and we uh, we all see it. Uh, at the national level, maybe at the international level, at the local level, you name it, is uh, this conversation about science and religion. Just this morning, I read a piece, uh, a report that uh, from Sacramento that was saying they, they uh, credit churches 
uh, for 30% of the spread of the virus because of their unwillingness to uh, embrace science and, and embrace the advice of doctors, you, you, you know, uh, and researchers. And I know you are a specialist in the area of science and religion. Um, how are you, how, what are your thoughts about this conversation and, and how, how does it get so distorted uh, in certain religious circles that somehow science is our enemy? It's fascinating to me that this is a pra very practical and tragic example of an attitude that really has a history going back to probably mid to late 19th century American culture, where fundamentalism and religion saw itself as um, over against other cultural norms or authorities of knowledge. There was no both end, where there were domains of, of uh, interaction, where we created coherent worldviews that required all of us. So the Bible was the only norm for knowing. We know that point of view. And on the other side of it, secular culture uh, in the universities sometimes took a point of view that exacerbated the problem by themselves having a kind of intellectual fundamentalism of, of sorts, uh, kind of a, a reductionist fundamentalism. So we've seen this thing grow and swell through culture and really never die down entirely uh, in, in American culture, this warfare model of the relationship between science and, um, and uh, religious faith. And now it takes practical dimensions when you see this uh, attitude of, we don't need to pay attention to science because it's really not authoritative. We'll follow our pastor and he's gonna have a service this week because he, like us, really sees that this is, uh, this is just false knowledge. And we're seeing the practical effects of it, of, of that model, as opposed to one that looks for coherence across various domains of knowing as all gifts of God. Mm -hmm. All of it is a gift of God and finding ways to develop coherent relationships across all domains of description of who we are and what the world is and its relationship to ultimate things. Uh, this, is a, this is a task that really should involve uh, all of us from every domain. I should be able to go to an interdisciplinary conference of people in biology and bioethics and chaplains and philosophers, and we should all be able to humbly respect the knowledge coming from, from the other and build it into something that's uh, beautiful together and that leads us forward. And so it's tragic when you see this kind of uh, one dimensional thought about mm. the sciences and its effects right now. Do you think that, uh, you know, uh, when we think about uh, people just, it's almost like pr prying our cold dead fingers off of gathering together, you know, because we, we just can't let that go. It's so much part of our, our DNA. Um, and it's been, I think I see it even in progressive thinking uh, congregations who still have a desire to find some kind of physical way to connect. Um, uh, we feel strongly at St. John's that we're, we're doing everything to discourage any kind of connection. Um, but um, it does raise the question of, you know, how we can be community, how the incarnation happens uh, if you will, in our midst, even though uh, it's all on a screen right now or on a phone, um, how, how do you how do you look at this time in that uh, in those terms? You know, I think it's a kind of interesting uh, exploration that we're doing, uh, and it needs to be done with uh, intellectual and spiritual honesty. Because I think, for example, there have been lots of things online, and I know Ruth Myers is going to address this in a short essay, but we, uh, we're trying to find ways to replicate what we're missing and gathering around the Eucharistic table. So how are we going to do this to recreate this sense of the spiritual embodiment of Christ through one another as we gather? And um, part of the spiritual honesty is recognizing not just the real presence in that moment, but the real absence in that moment as well. 
that part of our spirituality is to recognize that even with the Eucharist, we're only getting a glimpse of something that's beyond us, that's greater than we now can know, or greater than we fully participate in. Uh, this is not all, you know, the, all that we hope uh, as we go out. As, as we were doing the story of Lazarus, um, it's a spooky, in some ways, terrifying story because you know, he comes back to life. He's resuscitated, not resurrected. He has all the aches of his arthritis again, and he's seeing all the rest of us the way he always did. It's not a resurrection. <laughs> right. And in a way, I think that, um, that uh, we ought to leave room for the more, so to speak. And when we have this moment to see that it's not like it was last week when we were gathered around the table, we're brought back into... Uh, connection with what is always the case, that there's an absence as well as a presence in our spiritual uh, spiritual life. Well, so maybe on some level, if we, if we look at it that way, we embrace the absence in a new way now, yeah. so that we can also embrace the presence in a new way uh, as we move forward. You know, but I wanted to also add the others, another side to this that I feel anyhow, uh, let me do it through a personal story. I was thinking of what does incarnation mean, this extension of ourselves, this idea of embodiment and extending it into community. I remember a time when Carolyn, our daughter, was away for her semester abroad, and she chose to be in a little village just on the side of India, uh, just south of Nepal. And one of her uh, times was to have a field trip going into the Himalayan foothills, which to us are mountains. Mm -hmm. And she went unprepared, uh, and I received a phone call from her by satellite uh, saying that she was cold. So I asked uh, her to put her supervisor on the phone and discovered from him, yes, we knew that our students would come up unprepared. We were, that's part of the experience here and we'll take care and make sure she's warm. Now, what isn't our incarnational about that? I trusted him as a human being. I was in relationship with their community. I felt the care. Uh, the human experiences of taking care of one another in real action was incarnated in a certain way there. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily uh, a biological incarnation. It was what we were praying a few weeks ago outwardly in our bodies. It was out of the biology into an extension of who we are through our actions with one another. And that's part of incarnation. Yeah. That's, that's very nice. Um, another thing that has come up through all this, which has always been a theological issue, the odyssey, uh, uh, the idea of where does, where do, why do good things happen or bad things happen to good people and whatever, or, um, are there even such things as good people <laughs> or bad people? Uh, I, I think um, the blame game that's happened um, you know, through all of this, whose fault is it? And uh, uh, initially, uh, the, you know, people referring to it as a Chinese virus um, right. would be a great example of the, the, the racism that, that uh, comes out of such, out, out of such times. What, what's your advice to, to folks as, as they struggle with suffering and, and fear and grief um, uh, and how to move through that faithfully? Whoa, that's a, that's a large and big question. You got but one I, minute. I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a headliner. I'm gonna give you one of my thoughts about this because it's led me to a more uh, generous spirituality than I probably started with in my life. And that is the blame game goes back to our mythologies of origins when uh, Adam said Eve did it and Eve blamed, blamed the serpent and um, we're all blaming that whole team for getting us into what's called the fall, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we can then go from there to blaming Chinese and, and blaming uh, everybody else. So there's a sense of projection that starts, I think, in our theology. I've often thought that if you looked through our, at our origins through different eyes, we might see it as having originated in a jungle, an entangled jungle and not a garden, pro probably because uh, uh, 
extinction, death, and suffering preceded uh, us, our species, before we came on the scene. And so those are conditions that would create alienation. So I understand the sense of alienation that precedes us personally, that has a deep root. But that's a description. The fall is an explanation, which I don't think um, is, is very, very helpful. Uh, if, I, if I take a look at, uh, if I think about a, a three-year-old child in the kitchen with her mother, then all of a sudden she leaves to go into the living room to, to go to the fishbowl to see how fish live outside of water, scoops it up and throws it out on the floor just to watch it crawl around. That child isn't rebelling, it's exploring. And that, uh, but that exploration has probably tragic consequences for the child, disappointing ones because the fish doesn't survive. Uh, something like that probably is as good a description of our finite condition that leads to all kinds of alienation. And it's really hard to put a finger on who's at fault because it all has origins that precede any one of us and we're all entangled in it. Um, so, uh, but, but we all also feel this need to find out why, why did this happen to me? I want an explanation. Who did it? You know, so that human impulse won't go away, but maybe, uh, maybe that we can cut away just over time at that sense of fault, you know, hmm. and fall with it because the theology of fall is looking for a way to see all of us as tainted. Some will make it out, some won't. It, it can become a blame game too. Yeah, I think certainly one one fruit of all this is to begin seeing us all as interconnected. Yeah. And, and trying to make these black and white judgments or disconnect us from the world. I, it, it's very interesting as we approach Earth Day to think of the Earth uh, taking a a clean breath of air right now <laughs> with all the cars off the road. Uh, yeah. It, all these things, these interconnections are, are very profound. Well, it I really thank you true. for your connection to, to us today. And uh, we so appreciate you taking uh, uh, your valuable time uh, to, to uh, be part of this uh, interview. And uh, we look forward to a time when we can meet face-to-face uh, -face around that altar. And yes. Remem remember this time when we were learning abs uh, the absence of the incarnation on some levels and uh, celebrating more in, in yes. the presence of the incarnation. Scott, thank you for this time together and for this creative idea about having a conversation. It gave me an excuse to be able to see you even if on screen today. And I, I, uh, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Take care. You too.